What's up guys, I'm here for a very quick impromptu video. I want to expand a little bit more on a topic that I brought up at the end of my last video that sparked a lot of interest from people. It was on Libya. I want to redo a shorter video regarding that topic because it was a pretty long video, my last one. I don't know how many people got to the end of it, uh, but it's a very, very valuable story to understand. Um, also, in 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 uh, in terms of being able to step back and understand what's going on Xinjiang, uh, on with Xinjiang and the narrative, you know, same kind of a thing. Uh, Libya was a target for Western geopolitical uh, interests. Um, and all kinds of fake human rights abuses and stories of bombings and killings and rapes, all the same kinds of stories that are recycled over and over wherever the target country is, which ended up being fake afterwards or never proven and nobody even cares to look to see if they were true or not because the people in power, they know they weren't true. <laughs> and a lot of this stuff is is very, very obvious, but nobody talks about it. You just forget about it after it's mission accomplished. And it's very valuable to understand that that's exactly what's happening in Xinjiang, to understand the what, where, why, and how, to see that um, these are the same kinds of human rights abuses and stories that you were fed before to be lied to over and over and over again. And every single time you're falling for it. And also to imagine what Xinjiang would turn into if you guys are successful and the people that you are supporting um, are successful. It would also look like Libya, a place torn by, torn up by terrorism, um, uh, where their social programs are, are, are pushed back down. Um, they're we're basically just destroying a region. And, and actually, there's a second video I've got to eventually make, but I got a lot of information I got to tie together because after my last video came out, which was more about ETIM, terrorism, what is the target for uh, Xinjiang, what is the purpose, the goal? Some of these terrorist connected people, they went into an absolute meltdown. Like I'm talking one of the guys who uh, originally kind of sought me out um, and the guy who said he's writing an article on me. This guy started, uh, I'm talking like two or three dozen tweets within, you know, a very short period of time after I released uh, the video. And um, he even sent tweets out talking about, oh, one day I'll pay the price. I hope to meet you face to face and call, uh, a call to action for his other terrorist friends to start attacking me as well on Twitter, uh, specifically asking for that. Um, I want, I'll quantify that terrorism word too. I'm not just saying that as an insult. Like I'm talking the people who came out of the woodworks are ISIS connected people, um, ETIM guys, the same kinds of guys that are, are talking about ethnically cleansing Xinjiang after they take over. Interesting to see the infighting also talking up some saying, okay, well, the, the Han Chinese will either be, uh, removed by force or, you know, whatever, uh, but they have to leave. Some of them saying, no, the Mongols have to go too. It doesn't matter that they were here longer than us. Some of them say, well, the Han Chinese can stay as long as they convert to Islam. So you see a lot of infighting. I mean, it's got it's got all the, the telltale signs that if ever this was successful, <laughs> it would turn into an absolute war zone. Because also on top of that, you probably have some Uyghur separatists that don't want any of this religious extremism, but they're relying on religious extremists to accomplish their goals here, um, to completely uh, take over. And they're not just going to say, okay, here you go. Let's hand it over to the nice guys now. That's not going to happen. Um, so this rabbit hole that was opened up by this guy, Sabor, contacting me has given me so much additional information. And so many of my Muslim friends from overseas, from, from, from Pakistan, from Iran, from Iraq, and from Egypt, from Egypt, the guy, uh, that's the one I was talking about, who joined Al-Qaeda when he was younger and had direct contact with ETIM. They've given me so much insight into what I'm experiencing, what these people are saying, giving me the context behind it. Um, and talking to me more about what these people want to accomplish. And I need to get all of the information together and put it into the most compressed, comprehensive package I possibly can. And then I'm also going to bring um, those Muslim friends onto my show at some point as well, because I think it's so important to recognize that when you see these Muslim extremists um, waving the East Turkestan flags, they are not representative of the Muslim world. Most Muslims stand against them. That's exactly why when there was that UN resolution, what was it, like 20-something countries condemned China and what they were doing in Xinjiang. However, 54 countries, mostly Muslim countries, said, no, we don't believe these lies and we support China's policy in Xinjiang. And um, 
most people, when you tell them that, they're just like, okay, well, they're corrupt countries, or maybe they have dealings with China. They don't care that the other 20-something countries have alliances with the U.S. or what kinds of financial interests they have. They just are looking for a way to just call these Muslim countries corrupt and disregard them, while simultaneously uh, pretending to actually care about Muslims. This is a point in particular that my friend in Egypt is infuriated by, and he's written about many times. So the, I really want to bring them on to, to give their perspective. Why is it they support the uh, uh, why is it they support China and the Xinjiang policies and why is it they're not falling for the over exaggerated kind of BS claims about what's going uh, on there so that people get a chance to see real personalities explaining to you why Muslims don't stand with these people why Muslims feel that these East Turkestan separatists and what they do and what they stand for and what they want to accomplish are evil I've got so many stories I'm so anxious to tell you about but again I want to try to Put that into a different video. That's not what this video is about. Um, and uh, so let's get into Libya. So Libya, what I'm going to do, um, I'm first going to share a new video, which I have not shared before. Um, this is uh, something I just came across. A, a Twitter friend has sent it to me. It's it's an African guy speaking two months before Gaddafi was killed, saying Gaddafi is going to be killed. There's no way that the West will, will let him stay alive. And this is why. And... Pay attention to the passion, the anger, the frustration in his voice. Because we all know that Libya has been turned into a hellhole. That, well, not we all know. I mean, if you're paying attention, you know that there are African slaves being traded in open markets in Libya now. You know that Libya used to be the richest uh, country in Africa. And it's been reduced to um, tribal conflicts and terrorism and uh, Western exploitation of their resources. We know that they screwed up one region. But what this guy does is he paints the bigger picture to let you know that this didn't just, well, he didn't, he didn't, he was speaking from the perspective of before Gaddafi died, but this isn't just a matter of destroying Libya. This destroyed so much possible progress for all of Africa. And the Western countries knew exactly what they were doing. And this is why when he talks about Obama basically being a war criminal, just like every president before him, he says it with such confidence. And this is why when he says that Martin Luther King would be ashamed of Obama, he says it with such confidence. Just listen to the passion in his voice. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to leave you with that video. Then I'm going to follow up with the video that came long after Gaddafi's death, where his spokesperson is like, where are you guys now? What's going on? I thought you said all this stuff was happening. I thought we're supposed to be a happy democracy now. How about you start proving some of these accusations against us? And let me tell you, if ETIM and these terrorists were successful in Xinjiang, it'd be the same thing. It'd be the same thing. You know, you, you, you won't care to reconcile as soon as you get a whiff of the fact that the, 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 the stories you were told about rape and sterilization and concentration camps were false, as soon as you get a whiff for, for, of that, you're going to look the other way. You're going to forget about these people. It doesn't care if they're way worse off than when you arrived, just like all of the other places you've gone in. You won't, you won't care about that. Um, and we, we know that's true. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not theorizing. We know that's true. We, I, we can take Libya as an example. You don't care. You don't care that you were lied to. You don't care that NATO went in based on these false accusations. There was no reconciliation period after it. So if you were successful in Xinjiang, which you're not going to be, by the way, but even if you were, you won't care that you were fooled. You're going to move on to the next place and do the same thing over and over again. When, when are people going to learn? Anyways, I don't know how you can't watch this next video and not feel the emotion from this guy when he talks about what you did to him and his country and his continent. Pay attention, and I'm going to follow up with more videos that ties in the bigger picture of what's going on here. Hope you enjoy, and I'll see you next time. Peace. Today, I will give you the reason why the West is fighting Gaddafi. I'll tell you exactly what is really going on in Libya. I will tell you what the mainstream media will not tell you. There are three reasons why Gaddafi has to die. And among those three reasons, none of them have to do with him killing his own people. Number one, Gaddafi is the one who gave the opportunity for an African satellite for communication. It is in 1992 that 45 countries in Africa decided that they want to have their own satellite. 
This will cover internet, telephone communication, and all other communications. But the problem was how to find the money for this project. Where did they get the money from? They decided to go to the IMF. But the IMF knew that sponsoring this will be more dangerous for Western countries. Why? Because Western countries were making $500 million per year for all telecommunication in Africa, even inside Africa. $500 million per year. Not includes interest. That's how much they were making. So it is in 2007 that Gaddafi will come up with most of the money for this project. Africa will now have his first communication satellite, which will give the opportunity to countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Algeria, Angola, Libya, and other countries to now have their own telecommunication satellites. They will now provide communication to their own people. It will only cost African countries $400 million, only a one payment of $400 million to make this happen. Now you imagine how much money does Europe lost because of this? $500 million per year that Gaddafi made them lose by sponsoring the satellite. Just Gaddafi himself comes up with $300 million and other countries can impeach them. So this is reason number one why they need Gaddafi dead. Two, Gaddafi and African countries decide to create three major banks in Africa. One, the AMF, African Monetary Fund. The African Monetary Fund will headquarter in Cameroon, Yaoundé. This was to be created in 2011, this year. With the African Monetary Fund, African countries will no longer need to go to the IMF, which is the International Monetary Fund. So just imagine yourself how much money Europe will lose if the AMF is created. When Western countries found that, that this is what was happening, they actually wanted to be part of it. I believe it is in 2006 in Yahoundé, Cameroon, that African countries decided that no other countries outside of Africa will be part of the AMF. Now you can imagine what's going on here. Not only that they try to cut them money, but on top of that, they don't even want them to be part of this. Because being part of this will mean that they will have to control what is going on. The second bank will be the Central African Bank. The Central African Bank will be headquartered in Abuja in Nigeria. What this bank will do, it will stop African countries from using Western currency. Like if you go to Africa today, the countries like Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Gabon, and many other French-speaking countries are using the franc CFA. With this bank, we will have our own currency, like the Naira in Nigeria. Gaddafi, once again, came up with most of the money for this project. And the third bank that was supposed to be created was going to headquarter in Libya. The Bank of Investment. 
This bank will control most of investment in Africa. The central bank of investment. Now you imagine yourself what's going on here. Gaddafi is trying to break Western economy by doing this. But that's not his intention. His intention is to free Africa from his trap. African people want to be independent. Western countries don't want that. And that's what's going on here. So the money that Obama confiscated stole from uh, uh, Gaddafi is the money that was going to help for all those projects. He's telling you today that Gaddafi is trying to kill his own people with that money. No, Mr. President, you know that that's not true. He probably doesn't even know because he has no experience. He has no experience. He doesn't even know what's going on. He's like a puppy. They tell him what to do. Oh, well, let me inform you, Mr. President, that money was going to sponsor all those projects. That money that you confiscated from Libya. The third reason why Gaddafi has to die has to do with the United States of Africa. This man has been pushing African countries to unite, just like the United States of America. The very first thing that European countries, when they were colonizing African countries, did was to divide African people. When you want to break a powerful home, you have to find a way to turn that family against each other. That's the very first thing Western countries did to keep us from being powerful. The second thing they did was to stop education. Make, make sure that African people are not educated. Education is the key to success. By us being educated and educating our own people, we are stopping major problem in Africa. And the third thing they did was to place dictators in power in Africa who will give them everything they want. And every time that the population will stand up, these dictators will have the support of European countries to kill those protesters. They were all surprised with what happened in Tunisia, in Egypt. And they took the opportunity to then create a problem in Libya. Not one of you will show me footage of the same uprising that we saw in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya. Not one of you will show me that type of footage. This was created by Western countries. When you go to Libya, you get free education. I'm talking about college education, free healthcare. When you are newlywed and you don't yet have a job, you get free apartments. Libya is a beautiful country. And today they are telling us that Gaddafi is killing his own people. But yet he's the same one who is giving them everything. Educate, free education, free health care, feeding his own people, and killing them again. Does that make sense to you? Let me tell you what the countries that are bombing Libya today have in common. They are broke. Oh, yes, they are broke. Just the United States alone is borrowing money from China. Europe is going down with the euro. Every one of those countries in NATO are broke. And Gaddafi is making it worse 
by giving African people independence. And that's why you see Hillary Clinton going to Africa and telling African people to reject Gaddafi. Don't deal with Gaddafi. In fact, they've requested that the rebels open an embassy in Washington, D.C., making an illegal movement legal. That's what the Obama administration is doing. Hillary Clinton is also asking African people not to deal with China. <laughs> Tell me, let me just ask this. What, what can China do to African countries that Western countries haven't done yet? I like to know myself. How worse can it be? Far as I'm concerned, China is not the one going around bombing other countries. I can't remember the last war China has been in. China is not the one going, killing African people today with drones. China is not the one fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan in the name of democracy. China is making money. Why not deal with China? What have you done to African people that is good? What have you given African people that is good? When you are going somewhere in Africa, in different African countries, and asking African people not to deal with China, what are we receiving in exchange of that? other than bombs, drones, and everything else. What are we receiving? China is the number one investor in Africa. The African satellite that I'm talking about today was put together by Chinese and Russians. We African people will survive. We survive your drones and your bombing, your insult, and everything else, your humiliations, we've survived that. China is not going to do anything to us that you haven't done yet. So, Mr. President, let me tell you this. If you're not ashamed, I'm ashamed for you. I'm embarrassed for you. The first African-American president. And this is what you are doing to your own country to the world, to the people of your race. You are the nightmare of Martin Luther King. He's always talked about his dream. But his nightmare was to see an African president of the United States of America doing what you are doing today misrepresenting the black race. We're not asking you to give your attention only on African people or only on black people, but to show a good example of what leading is, of what fairness is, of what democracy is really about. The things that Martin Luther King died for, not just for the liberation of African people, but for fair treatment of everybody, black and white equal, fighting together, sharing. This is an embarrassment, and this is a shame. And I hope you stay a one-term president. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed voters. Yes, we came. We saw, he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, I'll, I'm sure it did. Mainstream media around the world called you a liar, a mouthpiece for a regime that far from uh, this war being about imperialism, uh, this was a regime that was organizing mass rape as a policy using uh, Viagra and uh, other chemicals to complete mass rape policies, the massacring of unarmed protesters, and uh, you are basically a mouthpiece for air bombardment of civilians. Well, in any position you take, there are two powers. If you have on your side, then you are proven uh, as an honest party. The power of explanation and the power of uh, prophecy. And we had both. 
uh, after eight years, everything we said to explain what was happening in Libya proved to be right. We talked about terrorism, uh, extremism, tribal conflict, Western uh, imperialist project in the country to rob Libya of its wealth. But how does this excuse all these and the, and the power of prophecy, because we talked about what things would happen afterwards. The division of the country, the continuous uh, conflict. And we have proven right on this front as well. As for the charges, which may, were three main charges, the air bombardment of Libyan cities, which were uh, which was proven false almost immediately and the international media had to admit because they came to Libya and air bombardment is not something you can hide. Uh, secondly, the mass rape of 8,000 Libyan women. The country has been under control of our enemies and the West for eight years. Where are the victims and where are the convictions and where are the trials? After eight years, they haven't been able to prove any systemic rape of women during that time. And then uh, you have the uh, charge of killing 10,000 uh, innocent protesters in the first three days. Where are the names? Where are the bodies? At the most, they have uh, been able to come up with 25 people who were killed in the first few days. We say they were armed. Some people say they were not armed. But 25 people killed is not 10,000. Libya was one of the richest countries in Africa. Libya has been under the attack of the West for eight years. It's supposed to be a democracy now, a happy country helped and saved by the West. Look at Libya now, killing, uh, civil conflict, tribal war, murder, terrorism, robbing of national wealth. What does remind you, uh, that remind you of uh, Afshin? Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, it's the same story happening every time. And some people still don't see it. For me, this is absurd. The truth is out there. And it really pains me that people choose their hatred against someone like Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein over the truth, over what is happening every single day for years and years and years. Uh, Gaddafi was very uh, honest and transparent with us. Uh, people who worked closely with him. And he said this. He said to us, make no mistake, we are being punished for what we did, not just for Libya, but for what we did for Africa and many other uh, developing countries. We are paying the price for supporting Nelson Mandela, for supporting the black race, for supporting real politics of revolution. Gaddafi was happy to fight until his death. He knew he had many ways out. He chose not to go out. He was offered ways out, even by African leaders who visited him uh, during uh, the war. But he said if he goes out, the very ideas he fought for will die. In his death, his ideas will live. And I believe uh, the, uh, the ideas and the principles and the projects he led will live on and will come back with such power in the future.